Yes, thank you very much, Deborah, for your nice introduction and uh, what a wonderful audience. Thank you to uh, you all for being here and we'll do that with a little help of Zoom today. Uh, this is one of the, maybe uh, there's a very few good things about this uh, pandemic uh, is uh, that we can, by Zoom, we can connect to others in other countries more easily now. Okay, I would like to start uh, with a personal remark. This is not Ireland, uh, this is in the Grisons. This is the, the village of my forefathers. This is how it looked about 60 years ago. Uh, and this was flooded. Now it looks like this. And this is like an image for what also has happened to the Irish heritage. A lot of it has been flooded and we have only a little bit um, of yeah, relics left from that period of time, which is somehow a sad thing. But I would like to say also with that, it's not the only thing where we happen to have things like that. It's, uh, it's It probably belongs to the human condition and the human life that we lose things also. So, um, in respect to the Irish high culture of the early medieval period, St. Gaul, where I have to luck, the luck to work, is a treasure hoard. A treasure of Irish manuscripts dating back more than a thousand years has been brought here by Irish friends of the Abbey from the 7th to the 10th centuries. And, well, I would like to say with the help of God, they have remained <laughs> in our Abbey Library, my library, now through the ages. And here it is for those of you who haven't seen it yet. It's the most beautiful library in the world. <laughs> and um, it's one of the oldest libraries in the world still existing also. It has a, it holds a unique collection, really worldwide unique, collect, unique collection of Carolingian manuscript. That means manuscripts between uh, the 8th and the 11th centuries. And many of them were produced locally here by the St. Gallen monks. So that's the, the biggest part of the collection was produced by the monks of here. But then we have our Irish corpus and this corpus can be considered the most coherent collection of written sources relating to early medieval Ireland. Now I'll, I will try to give you the story of this collection in the next 40 minutes. This is my plan. Um, and I guess we start right away. You, you can also um, read what I tell you now, even more el elaborately. Uh, we have this catalog that was published a few years ago. We had an exhibition about our uh, Irish collection. And the catalog is available. If, you, if you're interested in our web shop, I have all the data here. And I will send them to Deborah after the talk so she can forward them to you. Um, okay. Now let's start with Notia Balbulus on the Irish. Notia Balbulus was a, was a St. Gallen poet and musician. He may be considered the Bob Dylan of the ninth century, because he made songs that were sung uh, all over Europe uh, for centuries. These songs did not, uh, uh, they were not about love or society as with uh, Bob Dylan, but they were about God and what Notke read in the Bible. Um, this is just a different time than today. As a student in the monastery school of St. Gaul, he had one teacher that was called Moingal. Moingal was an Irishman. So there was an Irishman among the teachers in the monastery around the middle of the ninth century, which is interesting. I'll tell you more about that later. We, we know more about that. Notke wrote some kind of a, a biography of uh, Charlemagne the deeds of Emperor Charles the Great. It's one of his most famous works. 
And it starts in book one, the very first chapter starts with a, with a story about the Irish. Um, you have it here. When he had begun to reign, that means Charlemagne, alone in the western regions of the world, and the study of letters was almost everywhere forgotten, and even the worship of the true God had become tepid, two Scots from Ireland, Scots is the name for Irishmen, <laughs> men incomparably learned in both secular and sacred writings, <laughs> with British merchants. This must have been before Brexit, maybe. <laughs> Although they offered nothing for sale, they regularly cried out to the crowds who gathered to buy things. If anyone is keen for wisdom, let him come and get it from us. They insisted that they had wisdom for sale because they saw that the people had come to trade in what was for sale, not what was for free, so that they might stir up all who were coming to wisdom before everything else or subsequent events were to prove they might turn them to astonishment and wonder by their cries. So that's the story uh, that Notke Balbalus from St. Gallen told about the Irish and that was his view of the Irish. Um, these Irish wisdom sellers were fascinating for the people on the continent. They looked different probably they did different things, like getting up at night and pray. Funny things, and <laughs> things no, no and normal people would not do. They were able to communicate also. They were good in talking. And they brought, and this is the most in, uh, important thing, they brought idealistic Christian thinking with them. This thinking owed a lot to Platonism and to the great Christian philosopher, St. Augustine. This is St. Augustine's time. The first, uh, the first part of the medieval period is actually Augustine's time. Every human being deserves respect because it has a soul, and the soul is the divine in every woman and every man. That is the philosophical center of our Christian religion. For the locals in Europe, it looked as if these Irishmen were able to fly. They told of the life outside the hollow, maybe you know, the cave of Plato, the, the real world, the most important things are outside the hollow. And we're, we have, uh, we're bound to the hollow, but we, we're interested in the things actually outside the hollow. And that's what they were in fact talking about. They did Christian metaphysics, theology, they gave hope and consolation. They also offered enrichment to religion by fusing different ideas of divinity by the way of Trinity. You may, I'm sure you, you know the shamrock, uh, the three leaf clover of St. Patrick that has become a national symbol of, for Ireland. Patrick is said to have explained Trinity with the help of the shamrock. Trinity is a very, very interesting concept because it unites three different concepts of God. We have a more patriarchal view with God the Father. We have God as a human being with Christ. As you remember, the, the Greek, the Romans, and the, the Germanics had also um, human gods. Um, but then it was fused with the idea of love. This is very special for Christianity. This is something unique, actually, and uh, hardly any other religion fuses itself so, so um, strongly with the idea of love. And then we have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is certainly a very free idea of God. God is everywhere. God may be pantheistic God. God may be reason whatever. So that's uh, the three together, they form a very diverse view of God. God has many different sides, and this made the idea much more interesting to people at that period of time than what they had, because normally they had just one side of this God. So I, I think, I believe that Trinity is one of the keys to why the European continent was was missionized so quickly actually and during a few centuries 
with Christianity. It was just attractive. So, and the, the, the Irish played an important role in this movement. Uh, they were, I'd like to use the word, uh, they were like flight instructors. They learned people how to fly spiritually. But let us have a look at some examples of Irish wisdom we store here in the Abbey Library. First, let's look at an example of the Bible studies. This is Codex Delta, one of the best sources for the original Greek text of the Gospels. Delta, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, so it's the fourth in the stem, stem of the Greek um, Gospels. The manuscript was probably produced by an Irish circle in Bobbio. Bobbio is the monastery of Columbanus, the teacher of St. Gaul. In northern Italy, around the middle of the ninth century, so it's quite late actually, but it has, it must have had a very, very good transmission because it's a very good text. And this manuscript came at the middle of the ninth century to St. Gaul. Here we have another, some kind of a relic even for, uh, yeah, for the Irish in a way. Um, that's just, uh, I think it's five parts uh, together, five little parts. They come from the same leaf of a book. And the book holds Isidore's Etymologie. Um, and we know the text from other manuscripts, of course. Uh, we have here a text about the ears, about the parts of the body. Um, Isidore wrote uh, like an encyclopedia, what uh, the interesting things to know um, at the time. Uh, but what we can see here is the contribution of the Irish to, um, excuse me, to, to uh, the, the, the culture of script, of script. You see here this group. It starts with a with a bigger letter and then smaller letters, and finally it's, it ends up in the normal line. This is the initial composition. That's really an innovation the Irish made. You also have uh, interpunction. For example, here you have three three dots. Um, uh, that's like first uh, or different way of using interpunction uh, than the Romans did. Then we have here um, the, mini, uh, the use of minuscules and majuscules in the same script. So we mix the two. This helps to structure the text. And we have word separation. The Romans did not separate words. They had the scriptura continua, so just every uh, every character followed the other, no word separation, and the Irish introduced word separation. Why? Because they were not native speakers. They needed a little help to read the texts, and so that's why they made they structured them a bit more clearly, and they had this innovation. That's very important, an important contribution of the Irish culture to our culture that is still, uh, it's still very important today. Then we go to, um, to the ethics, uh, particularly uh, the Christian ethics of society and government. We have here a manuscript with, uh, this is not an Irish manuscript, it's a, it's a continental manuscript, but the, the text is Irish, the content is Irish. It's uh, a treatise that was made in the early 7th century in Ireland. De duode sim abusivi seculi. It's about the 12 abuses that live in the world. And we can look at these abuses and look at them maybe in the sense, this is like um, an ratgeber, uh, it's a, an advice for people to live good. So to avoid the bad things. And what are these bad, these principal bad things? Sapiens sine operibus, a wise man without good works is bad. Senex sine religione, an old man without religion, meaning an old person that doesn't think about what happens 
after death. Adolescent senior obediencia, a young man without obedience. Divas sine elemosina, rich man without charity is bad. Feina sine, sine pudicia, a woman without modesty, let's say. Dominus, dominus sine virtute, a nobleman without valor. Christianus contentiosus, this is quite interesting. Uh, a Christian, a strident Christian. We should be a bit moderate as Christians. Pauper superbus, this is a bit politically in incorrect today, but maybe it's true. Uh, a, a poor, a proud pauper. Hmm? And then very important, Rex Iniquus, an unjust king. Episcopus negligens, a neglectful bishop. Plebs sine disciplina, a community without order. Populus sine lege, a people without law. So these, these um, sentences are still important today. And that's actually the social ethics of Christianity that was transported into society. This would not have been possible during the antique, antique period with the Roman emperors. Nothing of that kind would, would have been possible. So you see, we have a change in society. And the Irishmen, uh, the Irish, they really work with that change. They help to work with that change. They're not the only ones, of course. Uh, but they are important. So that's the kind of inspiration the Irish brought to Europe, and that's how they became flight instructors. Now let us turn to two important Irishmen that have special importance for this uh, city and region here in St. Gallen. Columbanus of Luxoi. This is not Columkill. This is Columbanus of Luxoi or Columbanus of Bobbio. Uh, and of course, our Saint Gaul. We have here the oldest picture of the two. <laughs> it dates from the 15th century only, but we have the two. Uh, the older one here is Columbanus. The younger one is Gallus. And they are in a boat on the Lake Constance. First, uh, let's turn to Columbanus. He was the teacher of Gaul, and you know that he came with a band of missionaries from Ireland to the continent, around 600. He spent a few years in Luxoy in north, northeastern France. Then he came to Bregenz on the Lake Constance, and finally he continued over the Alps to Bobbio in northern Italy. That's actually the... the, the Columbanus, um, the Via Columbani that we are working on at the moment with several of the participants here. Okay. Um, he died in 615. Columbanus was quite a tough leader, but he was also very learned and inspiring. And sometimes we also feel a kind of humor in his writings. He calls himself once a rara avis, a rare bird, uh, when he writes to the Pope, I'm a rare bird. And just to give you one more example, this one here, it's very interesting and it's important for the Europe, for European history also. As far as we know, Columbanus was the first person to use the term Europe in a new sense maybe as a term for a new political and cultural area, including land north of the Alps, Ireland and England. And uh, Europe is, of course, a Christian continent for Columbanus. We can draw this from the greeting to Pope Gregory in one of the letters. This is the Epistola at Sanctum Gregorium uh, that have come down to us also here in a manuscript in the library. Also the best transmission of this letter because we have no 
uh, early medieval manuscripts left here. Uh, we have manuscripts taken from early medieval manuscripts in the Baroque period. And one of the, the best of them is in, in this library. Um, Columbanus writes, he calls the Pope the most august flower in all this wilting Europe. So from this, we can say he's the first to have a new concept of Europe. I think that's quite fascinating. Let's turn to Gaul. Gaul was a follower of Columbanus and he decided to remain in the Lake of Constance region. He became a monk here and founded a new monastic community that would eventually become the famous Abbey of St. Gaul. After the death of Columbanus, St. Gaul received his Irish staff. You may know the Kambuta. Kambuta is, are these Irish abbot staffs with the, uh, they're crooked on the on top. And we have them all over in pictures in St. Gallen, these Irish staffs, by the way, because Gallus got them, got the, got the one from Columbanus. And on images, Gallus, I mean, he, this is not quite correct. It would, would have, be, have to be like this, huh? not round, but huh? this would be the Irish staff of Gallus. Then he's usually shown with a bear. The bear brings Gallus a piece of wood for the fire. And Gallus says thank you to the bear and gives him a piece of bread. When you look very close, this piece of bread looks a bit, a bit like a football. Uh, and you may know that St. Gallen has the oldest football club on the European continent. But this is just a little remark on the side. <laughs> okay, many depictions of St. Gaul I'll show this Irish staff. Uh, it was kept as a relic, but lost, unfortunately, sometime after the 11th century. There was quite a heated discussion a few years ago if St. Gaul was Irish at all, or if he may have joined the band of Columbanus in Luxoy. Uh, or even here in the Lake Constance region. The argument was um, that Gaul knew very well how to speak German. And the, in his uh, Vita, that's mentioned. As he was preaching to the locals because he knew their language well. However, we have more convincing evidence for his Irishness. He seems first, to, he seems to have had a very special relationship with Columbanus and Columbanus sent him his Irish staff to St. Gaul from his deathbed. So probably he would not have done. Then Irish roots may also be the reason why a group of six Irish monks, Luxoy, wanted to convince him to become their abbot in Luxoy. We know this episode, uh, six Irish monks that explicitly mentioned uh, they're Irish, they come to convince St. Gallen, uh, to, to Gallus uh, to become the abbot in Luxoy. So that's a strong argument for his Irishness. And for me, important argument is Gallus is uh, made Bishop of Constance, and then he says, I cannot do this because I come from a foreign country. And he would not say this if he would have been Frankish or from, uh, from the Alemannic um, region. He must have been further away. So probably, uh, so Irish would be, uh, would fit very well for this. And of course, his Irish origin is mentioned a number of times in the same text that also mentions his competence in the German language. Finally, when you, uh, let's say you're a missionary and you want to come to Germany and, uh, and do a mission, what do, you, what do you do first? You learn German and it's not impossible. <laughs> so, so I would say uh, Gaul was Irish and he just learned uh, German somewhere in Luxoy. So I'm absolutely convinced and actually the, the, the argument has, has, um, is, has gone away now if uh, Gaul was Irish or not. 
And also, I mean, the Irish treasure hall we have here, that's really unique and very special, and there must have been a reason for that. We have more Irish saints present, not just Gaul and Columbanus, but also here we have once again, ah, here we have the staff. Huh? This, is, this one is better in the form hmm, of Gaul. Uh, more Irish saints. Now we can turn to Columkill. Columkill is also known as, as, as Columbanus, the older, the elder, uh, because he lived about a generation or two before Columbanus of Luxoi. And uh, he's also known as Columbanus of Iona, you know that, I'm sure. <clears throat> uh, in our manuscript, Codex Sangalensis 555, that has the life of Columkill by Adam Nam. It is a copy of the famous Adam Nam manuscript in Schaffhausen, one of the oldest Irish manuscripts worldwide. Uh, we have at the end of this manuscript, this sketch, and that's the oldest sketch of Columkill. We have him here, that's Sankt Columba, and that's how he is praying. And what's very interesting and has raised interest in, in some scholars lately, we have here reliquiaries. And we have those reliquiaries we know from the English and from the Irish um, culture. So it's very interesting that the St. Gallen monk who, who drew this picture, he knew how these reliquiaries looked like. So he must have seen a reliquiary of that kind. Uh, we have no such reliquiaries anymore here, but they must have had something like that here. Maybe in connection with Gaul, maybe in connection with somebody else. Other uh, Irish monks uh, linked uh, to the Abbey, Irish saints linked to the Abbey of St. Gaul are Magnus, the Apostle of Algoi in Bavaria, who is said to have been a follower of Gaul. Then Eusebius, he was a, a recluse. That means a person who lived in one room for his whole life. Um, he's said to have done this for 30 years, uh, quite a long time. <laughs> uh, he lived in the second half of the ninth century. And we also have charters that, uh, that really document that he lived. And of course, there is more evidence of Irish saints in, in numerous parts of, the, of our collections, such as pa uh, Patrick, Brigida, and or Blathmark, and so on. Now we turn to the Libris Scottice Scripti. This is the real treasure. And something that only exists once in the world. We have here a list of books written in Irish script from the second half, around 860. It's listed it's from 860 around. It's here start the Breviarum Librorum. That's the oldest library catalog of this library. And here are the normal books, it has several pages, 20 pages or something like that. Uh, and it starts with Bibliotheca Una. That means the sacred scripture starts, it's at the beginning of this catalog. And a Bibliotheca Una is a, a, a Bible in one volume. Uh, Bibliotheca Una. It's not a library, it's a Bible in one volume. And here on the, uh, it's on a separate page. Before that, we have this list of the Libris Cortice Scripti. What does that mean? Uh, it's, of course, Scottici, Scottici means Irish, huh? not Scottish, Irish. Uh, we have here a list with 28 texts. So maybe 28 volumes. That's a very large library for that period of time. Hmm. The, um, but when we look at the list and we try to identify these books, here in the present collection, there's only one that we can identify. And uh, I have to look at, uh, I think it's here, Evangelium Sanct Secundum Johanni in Volumine 
1. Uh, the, the Gospel of St. John in one volume. That's the only item of these 28 that we can identify find to date. So the rest was lost. So we may say at that period of time, they may have had an amount of about 50 Irish books in the library here, which is really a big, a big this, you know, a book time was much more than a hundred books today. And um, so that's a really large collection of Irish books. Now let's look at these, this um, Gospel of St. John. This is how it looks today. And when you look at this here, you see how this started. The initials, the beginning of a text started to be like that in the 7th century. And in the 9th century, it is a whole page. So we have a development to the so-called initial ornamented page. Uh, that's also an innovation that the Irish play an important part in. Maybe they're not the only ones, but they play an important part in that development also. Okay. We have here uh, St. John and his symbol, the eagle, and then the beginning in principio erat verbum. And the typical Irish ornaments, of course, and the Irish script here. Okay, now let's turn to Marcus and Moingal. That's something, another very special story. And this page is from the wonderful monastery chronicle of Eckehart IV, who wrote this in the middle of the 11th century. And he wrote the chronicle of the time from the end of the 9th to the end of the 10th century. What happened in St. Gaul at that time? And one of the first stories is the one here. Uh, it starts, you know, here the name Marcus, Scotti, Scotti Gena Episcopus, Marcus, an Irish bishop. And let's just have a look at what it means. At the time when the secular priest Grimaldus was abbot, Marcus, a bishop of Irish origin, visited his compatriot Gaul on the way back from Rome. He was accompanied by his sister's son, Moengal. And you remember, this is the same Moengal I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, the teacher of Notker, Balbulus. So this young man, Moengal, stayed with his uh, uncle in the monastery and Moingal became one of the important teachers of the greatest time of our monastery. So uh, it's like the, let's say, input from the outside. Huh? That's often interesting to, to become good. <laughs> okay, now Marcus had a library with him and he left these books in the abbey and we don't know if they were included in the list we just saw but we have some evidence that maybe one or two we can identify in uh, from other sources how did all this um these books come here uh Oh, let's no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I would like to say a few, a few things more about Marcus. We have something like an, a wandering Irish bishop. This was a difference in Ireland. Uh, bishops were charismatic. They did not have a see. They did not have a diocese in the first place, like on the continent. But they were much freer. They could be wandering around. So Marcus was one of these. And he was, he went to Rome and then came back. Maybe he was a bit uh, feeling not so good, whatever. And then he decided to, to stay. Now, turning back to the, maybe the books he had, we don't know, but we have a group of fragments that Carol Farr, um, an American uh, scholar in London, 
uh, she made investigated them a bit and she came to the conclusion that they must come from the Midlands, the Irish Midlands, because they have certain characteristics um, in the uh, in the ornaments, uh, like the faces here, uh, that kind of stuff, and also the script. Uh, well, here it is a bit difficult. Well, this one here, uh, maybe more uh, um, from the Midlands and not from Northern or, or Southern Ireland. We have here another one. Uh, again, she looked at these faces, for example, these faces here, how they were made and at the script. By the way, at th with this one, we also have old Irish charms, not just Latin, but a bit of old Irish also. Okay, here we have the cross table. And here's another one. This was not finished. As you see here, there would have been script. There must have been some more. Um, maybe these things are not finished either. This is a litany, Sancta Maria Ora Pro Nobis, Sancte Petre Ora Pro Nobis. Hmm? Uh, yes. So maybe these come from, uh, for stylistic reasons, maybe these come from the Midlands of Ireland. And we have then one, our most important, our most beautiful Irish book, this, the Irish Gospels of St. Gall. And they may also come from the Irish Midlands. And there, uh, Joseph Flay, Flay who, um, who, who um, worked on this, he says they may come, may come from Laura. I don't know if you know the monastery of Laura. Laura is uh, uh, close to, uh, by the River Shannon, uh, so it's in the middle of Ireland, quite in the middle actually. And this monastery was destroyed in 1842. So a, a few years before Marcus came to St. Gaul, Laura was destroyed, destroyed by the Vikings. Uh, by the way, the Stowe missile also comes, may come from Laura. So this may, may, might have been books that were saved from the raids from the Vikings. We don't know exactly, we have to speculate, but maybe that's uh, a good speculation. Now this gospel book, I'll just show you how it looks like, because it's very beautiful. We know the Book of Kells. The Book of Kells is like very special. But then we have a group of about 10 manuscripts, very beautiful manuscripts uh, from Ireland, um, part of the continent. Um, and this is one of these 10. I think it's the most beautiful one, actually. <laughs> we have uh, the four Gospels. And we start here with Matthew. Um, at the, and the Liber Generationum, Liber Gener, it's hard to read, but it says Liber Generationum. You see the, yeah. Uh, we have the angel. This is the symbol of Matthew. Then we have a cross again. And then the beginning, uh, text of Autem Generatio Sic Erat, this is also at the beginning of Matthew. Then we have, it, this seems to have been a different artist now, you see, it's more broad than the other one. This is the beginning of the Gospel of, of Mark, and here we have all the four symbols of the, the evangelists, interestingly. Yeah. And then beginning of the text. Uh, typical, the large heads uh, and the small hands and feet. One foot even has toenails. I think the left one has toenails. Then we have again the other artists. This is Luke with the flying bull. Quoniam yeah. qui, it starts. And then this is John, again, the other artist, more broad, again, a large head, small feet, and very formal. 
to me, they, they look a bit like uh, Byzantine, Byzantine art also, these here. Um, and here is the eagle, his symbol, and the beginning in principio erat verbum. Yeah. And then it ends with a, this a scene of the crucifixion on the left side, left hand, and on the right hand we have the last judgment, God judging the people. And these are six, twelve persons, the apostles. Yes. Okay. So we, we, it may be that this gospel was brought by Marcus. We do, we don't know. It cannot be ruled out, however, and. Or maybe also the other fragments that they belong to this story of Marcus and Moengal. And maybe they were saved from Laura in 842 and then brought to the continent and they stayed in St. Gallen around 1850. It's just a hypothesis, but it's possible. Now let us turn away. Uh, by the way, here not here. You have here the Irish script, and at the end. You have Carolingian minuscule of the region here. So a person in the ninth century made, uh, wrote some text here. So this is an, a, a clear sign that this manuscript was in St. Gallen probably already in the ninth or latest that the, uh, in the 10th century. That's quite clear. So now let us turn away from pictures to texts. Uh, this is the famous Irish Christian of St. Gaul. It was written in Northern Ireland, in Northern Ireland, uh, close to Bangor, so close to your place, maybe in the monastery of Nendrum at Strangford Loch. This is the place uh, Deborah knows very well. <laughs> or may also in Bangor itself. We don't know exactly, but that's Quite, that's uh, it's consensus among scholars that is it's there. The contents um, is not very promising actually. It's a Latin grammar. It's maybe actually be a bit boring, <laughs> but it's a very very interesting manuscript because we have a lot of texts in between the lines and in the in the margins, huh? and here, and then we have even something like this here. Okay, this was uh, also written around 850. Uh, and it's maybe the most interesting Irish manuscript at all. Um, it has 9,412 such glosses. So these remarks, nine, more than 9,000. More than half of them are in Latin. But 3,478 of them are in Old Irish. And this makes this manuscript one of the principal sources for the Old Irish language. So it's very, very important for yeah, the Old Irish language. Uh, some of the glasses, like this one here, that's why I have this page, uh, are wonderful poems. Uh, I don't know if anybody of you uh, can uh, read um, Old Irish, but it says here, Dom far kai fit by the all from kain loid luin luad na cel huas mo lebran indli nech, and so on. I give you a modern English translation. It's really a wonderful poem. All around me, greenwood trees, I hear blackbird verse on high, quavering lines on vellum leaves, bird song pours down from the sky. Over and above the wood, the blue cuckoo chants to me. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. I write well beneath the trees. So it's just the poem of a, of a, of a scribe that is writing in the wood. Translation by Sharon Carson. 
Okay, let's go back to this page and now we turn to this here and um, on the upper end of the uh, parchment we see some funny signs. What's that? Let's have a closer look. It's Orm. Uh, Orm is actually only used with tombstones. Uh, it's the script they used on tombstones. There is no other testimonials for Orm in manuscripts than this uh, and about uh, seven or eight other instances where they, where they use that in, in the manuscript. Um, what does it mean? We can decipher Orm. It's not really uh, uh, it's not uh, difficult because uh, these signs they all correspond, correspond to Latin letters. We have a clear system um, it's not very sophisticated actually, it's easy to do that. And it means la teert, la teert. And this was translated by somebody by killed by beer. So this monk may have had a hangover and yeah, drunk too much, not Guinness, it was before that. Um, but of course the Irishmen, they, the Irish monks, they had beer. So you see, sometimes it's quite in, funny also, these uh, glasses. We also have glasses about that they, they are really tired of writing now. It's cold and they, they want to stop writing. So it's sometimes quite emotional what they write in this manuscript. So now I have to round up. We have more Irish visitors. Uh, you can look at this catalog, to, we have this list in there, for example, and many other, info I've, I've just uh, given a small part of, of the whole thing now. Um, for example, we have this one, just as a last example, we have in the annals of the monastery here, Phailanus Cotus Beate Memoriae de Hoc Seculo Migravit. That means the Irishman, Scotus, Phailanus, Phailan, Beate Memoria, with good memory, departed from this world. So in, this is 961, I think, or 91, 991. Uh, at that time, they must have had an Irish monk still in the in the monastery in the community now you know when i when i look for example for english english um, uh, relics in this in our manuscripts there's hardly anything to find we have a lot of beat manuscripts uh, but there is really not no no such evidence in our manuscripts as with this with this with the irishman so it's it seems really to have been a very very special relationship now this Phailan, this Phailan of blessed memory, we don't know anything else about him. He probably was a monk and maybe a teacher in St. Gaul and he was Irish, that's all. But I'm sure he was a flight instructor and that he's still flying around somewhere out there. That's it. <laughs> Dora Mai. I think it's uh, it's hard to to pronounce for me <laughs> but thank you very much